Thank you. Okay, just want to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Awesome. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, so today's uh, topic is considerations for high risk drinking or alcohol use disorder in pregnancy. Um, a lot of content to cover, so I will probably go quickly, um, but this will be recorded. So that is very helpful for people. I tend to talk fast so that works well for everybody. Um, so what we're going to do really is provide um, an overview of evidence-based approaches to identifying and managing high-risk alcohol use and alcohol use disorder in pregnant patients. So um, just before we get started, I'd like to go through some statements of acknowledgement and disclosure. Um, and just first off, I myself am, am presenting um, from the unceded traditional territories of the, the Kwangan speaking people in Victoria, particularly the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations, and feel really grateful to be in this um, community and to do my work here. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that the, the material is made possible through financial contribution from Health Canada and the GPSC committee, um, as well as a partnership, which is a partnership of the government of BC and doctors of BC. Um, but it's important to know that the views expressed here and do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada or the GPSC. And so very quickly, um, my name is Dr. Sarah Lee. I have lots of official titles, um, but basically what you need to know about me is that I am um, a family physician with specialized training in both maternity and obstetric care and addiction medicine. Um, and I do general addiction medicine, but my, my focus and my passion really is on providing perinatal addiction and perinatal substance use support. Um, and I have no relationships to disclose here today. Um, in terms of disclosures of commercial support, um, the BC ECHO team would like to disclose financial support from Health Canada and the GPSC as presented on the, the slide, um, as well as in-kind support from the BC CSU. And also the BC CSU is providing me an honorarium for my participation in today's session, which I'm disclosing as a potential conflict of interest. Um, in terms of mitigating potential bias, um, before we, we publish and sort of go through this information, we do take steps to make sure we mitigate any potential bias in this program. So all the content has been reviewed for potential bias, validated by members of the Independent Scientific Planning Committee and approved for accreditation submission. And now quickly before we dive into the fun stuff that everyone's wanting to learn about, um, some objectives. So, you know, just sort of reflect on this slide and keep in mind, um, this is what we want you to take away from at the end of today's discussion. So we want you to be able to describe the clinical implications of alcohol use disorder in pregnancy and summarize what the key principles of care are for this patient population, be able to utilize screening tools for high risk drinking and AUD in pregnancy, um, practice harm reduction approaches. This is really important um, for individuals who continue to drink or have undertreated AUD in pregnancy, and be able to discuss comparative advantages and disadvantages of available treatment interventions for high risk drinking and AUD in pregnancy. So, to get started, um, we just wanted to provide a little bit of a background around the prevalence of alcohol use during pregnancy and its implications. So, um, you know, whenever we're talking about um, prevalence, of substances being used in pregnancy. First and foremost, it's really important to understand that this is always underreported. Um, you know, there's huge stigma around using substances in pregnancy, particularly I think around alcohol in pregnancy, and we'll talk more about that later, but um, also the data is really hard to come by. So this is our most recent data in Canada and it's from 2009. And so it reports 62.4% um, of pregnant individuals reported drinking alcohol in the three months before pregnancy. 10.5% reported consuming alcohol during pregnancy. Um, and so again, remember that this is likely underreported. And this more or less aligns with American data, which was from 2019, which showed alcohol consumption rates of around 11.5% among pregnant people. Um, and you know, this data does not reflect what is happening right now during this global pandemic, where we are seeing um, increased use of all substances. So really important to keep in mind when we're thinking about screening our populations. Um, probably most people know this but we'll touch on it anyway said alcohol use during pregnancy is associated with negative pregnancy outcomes this is really well um, documented and outlined in a lot of different places um, so we know that fasd fetal alcohol spectrum disorder affects approximately four percent of canadians and and what fasd is is it it refers to a range of negative alcohol pregnancy related outcomes including fetal growth restriction developmental delays, neurological abnormalities, and cognitive and behavioral issues throughout life. 
We also know that spontaneous abortion and stillbirth are among the adverse pregnancy outcomes of maternal sub, of ma maternal alcohol use. Um, and you know something really important to touch on is we know the research does suggest that these are harm these harms are dose dependent, meaning the more alcohol, the more the harm. But there's no real consensus on safe or low risk drinking for pregnant people. So here, our guidelines strongly recommend abstinence from alcohol during pregnancy. So when we're, you know, talking about um, accessing care for alcohol use disorder, you know, it's it's well the risks are well documented and. The general population has a good understanding. There's, you know, signage everywhere in alcohol, um, you know, stores where you can buy alcohol. Um, but alcohol use during pregnancy continues to often go unrecognized and untreated. So before we discuss the principles of care, this slide just really highlights the barriers that are prevalent, present to accessing um, care for alcohol use disorder. So a number of the barriers, you know, we've touched on this a little bit, fear of stigma and judgment by a healthcare provider. People are afraid to report, they're afraid what might happen. Huge fear of losing custody of children, um, especially current children, if there are children in your care or, you know, the, your future unborn child, um, if this alcohol use is reported. Um, and we touched on this again, but it is important to know that um, alcohol use in pregnancy is, is not a reason to disclosed to the ministry, it is illegal to report without a patient's consent, um, any harms you're about against an unborn child or unborn fetus. Um, lack of clinician knowledge regarding prenatal addiction care is a huge piece. So, um, you know, some people, um, we don't really screen adequately because we're not sure what the next step might be. So we're afraid to ask those questions. So, you know, lack of clinician knowledge regarding what is available. Can, can prevent people from screening and from detecting individuals in our care who might need the help we have. Um, concurrent or co-occurring co mental illness can be a huge barrier to accessing care, whether that be anxiety, post-traumatic stress. You know, there's a number of co-occurring mental illnesses that often occur in this population. Um, cultural or generational trauma hugely affects um, how people experience healthcare. And this is something important that we need to remember for the care that we're providing all patients, particularly our Indigenous population. And then lastly, lack of psychosocial support resources. So, you know, this could include lack of stable housing, um, not having a supportive partner, or not having, you know, a lot of family members available to help support you through this journey. So, we know that in pregnancy, people have increased contact with healthcare providers. And we also know that people's motivation to change is often higher during pregnancy. So, this really presents us a huge opportunity to identify and address alcohol use. So it's really essential to address all of these barriers and maximize the opportunity of engaging pregnant people with alcohol use disorder in our care. So in terms of principles of care, um, you know, we'll touch on this for the next few, sli few slides. And this is really intended to remove barriers to accessing um, care for alcohol use disorder in this population. And the BCCSU does have a forthcoming um, pregnancy supplement for um, high risk drinking and alcohol use disorder in pregnancy, and it goes way more into detail around this. But first and foremost, we need to respect an individual's autonomy, um, you know, and that goes into privacy and consent, you know, including making it clear that there is no duty to report perinatal substance use, um, and really make sure you're building that trust and that collaborative relationship with the patient. And these principles are, you know, of the utmost importance when we're building that trusting relationship. Um, make sure that you're using information and education to make sh to do shared decision making. So that's really a principle of trauma informed care, including the patient and the client in their decision making is hugely important and empowering for this population. Being mindful of the language we use um, and respects the patient's gender identity and reproductive intentions. And this can really increase patient engagement if we're mindful of this and respectful of how they identify um, and always providing culturally safe care and just understand um, and implement the principles of cultural safety and cultural humility. Um, next, one of the principles would be the, being aware of the social determinants of health. So this, this really touches on um, viewing alcohol use disorder during pregnancy in the broader context of the social determinants of health. So, you know, this considers things like early childhood experiences, um, socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation. 
So it's really important as a clinician working with this population to be able to identify and address any socioeconomic inequities that affects the patient's health. Um, so connecting them to, to resources that might meet these needs, for example, housing, access to food and nutrition, um, access to childcare for any additional children in their care, um, ensuring financial assistance, et cetera. Um, tra trauma and violence informed care is hugely important in this population and any pregnant person who's got problematic substance use. And so it's really important for us to incorporate the principles of trauma and violence informed care practices when we're caring for this population. Um, and this is because we know people with alcohol use disorder have a really high lifetime prevalence of trauma, including physical and sexual abuse. Um, and we also know that pregnancy is a really increased time of vulnerability for individuals who have experienced trauma. Um, you know, and healthcare providers should also be equipped to identify and respond to gender-based violence, since we know that pregnant individuals are at an increased risk of intimate partner violence. Um, and I don't know if it's gonna pop up on the slide or not, but there is a free training course through the PHSA um, Learning Hub. Yeah, I just learned about this. It's super exciting. Um, so it's, um, it can help you understand, identify and respond to and address gender-based violence. And I believe a link to this course will be sent out via email after this session. Um, and then Lastly, you know, making sure that we provide integrated medical management. And so this is really important for the care of this population. So making sure that our care plans extend beyond a substance focused approach. And this does improve long term outcome for the patient and their infant. So what this means is, is when able trying to provide integrated obstetrics, primary care and addiction treatment. So, you know, whether we can co locate services to reduce barriers to accessing. Um, make sure that we have medically focused mental health and wellness assessments and interventions as needed. Um, and so this includes checking for, you know, concomitant issues like insomnia, anxiety, and depression, which should also be addressed, addressed while we're treating alcohol use disorders, and then offering appropriate referrals to health and social supports when necessary. and harm reduction. So while we know that discontinuing alcohol use is the only way to fully eliminate alcohol related risks, we need to remember that comprehensive and continued care to pregnant patients should not be contingent on a patient's willingness to discontinue alcohol use. And this can be really challenging for a lot of clinicians. And we spoke about this a little bit before with the hub team before I came on here and we'll talk about this more, but because of the known teratogenic effects of alcohol in pregnancy, um, we can be really motivated to just want to abstain, 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 but we need to remember harm reduction is a principle of care and harm reduction has been shown to contribute to reduce drinking, improve nutrition and improve outcomes for patients and fetus. And we will touch on harm reduction approaches for specific for this population later on in the presentation. So let's get into the clinical pathway. So the first step is a screening and brief intervention. Um, so this provides, this is just a review of the AUD clinical pathways. We've discussed this in previous sessions and we'll just go over this quickly. Um, but we'll sort of discuss how each um, aspect of the pathway applies to this population, including sort of pregnancy specifics. So we'll touch on screening and brief intervention, withdrawal management and continuing care. So screening for high risk drinking and alcohol use disorder, if, if, you, if you take one message away, it is that you need to screen your pregnant populations for alcohol use. Um, and we need to not have these, not have these pre, pre imposed sort of biases thinking, oh, well, this patient wouldn't drink alcohol. So I'm just gonna take no, right? No, we need to screen every population, every pregnant individual, um, because we know how high the rates are of alcohol use in Canada um, and in other, communities and, and countries around the world. So this should be included in the first prenatal assessment, assessment or at the first opportunity that you feel is appropriate. And I do believe that we are here in British Columbia, we are getting a new um, pregnancy um, antenatal record that hopefully will better incorporate this into the screening. Um, and alcohol use screening should include education on Canada's low risk alcohol drinking guidelines, which does recommend abstaining from alcohol use during pregnancy. Um, in terms of screening tools, there's a really range, there's a, a range of validated and commonly used tools for this population. Um, so care providers should just use the screening method that they're familiar with and comfortable with. Um, a really great approach is to use uh, a single alcohol screening question, SASQ, 
Um, and this is just recommended to identify alcohol use in pregnant, pregnant individuals. So this method really saves time by just quickly identifying anyone who needs to be further assessed. So for example, a simple question, do you sometimes drink beer, wine, or other alcoholic drinks? And an affirmative yes um, would indicate the need for brief intervention and further assessment. So additional screening tools that have been validated for pregnant patients include the audit and audit C, the TA, and the tweak. So in terms of brief intervention, all patients who screen positive for alcohol use should be offered brief intervention. Um, and so brief intervention is just a time limited single session counseling and advice dialogue with the patient. So um, brief intervention with frequent monitoring is the recommended intervention for alcohol use in patients who do not meet an AUD diagnosis. So that's really important to, to understand that if we're talking just sort of at risk drinking versus AUD. So those are two different individuals we're thinking about. Um, in terms of brief intervention, so this typically involves motivational interviewing techniques to empower patients to make positive behavioral changes. And it includes components like exploring motivations for or against reducing alcohol use and identifying barriers and facilitators to change. It also involves assisting the patient to set goals and providing non-judgmental encouragement and support. In addition to um, brief intervention, patients who screen positive for any alcohol use should be offered further assessment to confirm or rule out a formal diagnosis of alcohol use disorder. Um, so for this purpose, care providers can conduct a structured interview based on the DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorders. Um, and it's important to note that all pregnant and postpartum patients with AUD should be offered or referred to treatment interventions and support services. So moving on in our pathway, the next discussion is around withdrawal management and so general, general consideration. So the next two slides will offer some, some information on withdrawal management strategies that are recommended specific for this population. So it's important to know that the research suggests that pregnant individuals may be more vulnerable to more severe symptoms of withdrawal due to their increased susceptibility to physiological and environmental stress. We also know that acute withdrawal may also cause adverse effects for the fetus. So this includes fetal distress, placental abruption, preterm labor, and fetal demise. So wherever possible, alcohol withdrawal management for pregnant patients really should occur in an inpatient setting. And uh, you know, I'll touch on that out outpatient withdrawal management with close monitoring may be considered in cases where risk of severe complications is low and social supports are accessible, or if this is a more of a harm reduction approach, but really ideally, we're looking at inpatient management for all pregnant patients. So like non-pregnant patients, all pregnant patients who develop symptoms of alcohol withdrawal should be offered withdrawal management and pharmacotherapy. So for patients with mild AUD and negligible symptoms who decline medication, you can offer close monitoring, supportive care, over-the-counter relief um, medication that has been approved for pregnancy. So, um, this includes, you know, ensuring they're adequately, they've got adequate nutrition, hydration, family involvement, and then medications like um, antiemetics, pain relievers, antidiarrheal medications that have been approved for use during pregnancy and lactation. Now, we can also talk about the use of the prediction of alcohol withdrawal severity scale, the pause scale or the pause tool, and this can be considered to guide a treatment plan. So, um, when we're looking at, this is, you know, I do want to highlight that this is specific to the pregnant population. So when we use this in the non-pregnant population, we're looking more at um, risk of complicated withdrawal and needing to be in an inpatient or an outpatient setting. When we're looking at this for a patient, a pregnant population, we are talking about recommending that all patients be considered for inpatient management. So when we're looking at the pause, um, the, you know, the expert consensus is that we can use this as a tool to help guide us in terms of choosing a medication for support of alcohol withdrawal. So for individuals who score less than four on the pause, we could consider either benzodiazepines or gabapentin. And these are individuals who are considered to be at low risk of severe or complex withdrawal. And for patients who score higher than four on the pause score, um, this is where we would recommend benzodiazepines that they're at a higher risk of severe complications of withdrawal. And the pause score is easily found. If you just Google pause, you can find it. And it's a simple six or seven question um, that you could easily do. Um, to help sort of guide your treatment decisions. So 
So when we're looking at continuing care, so after we've supported withdrawal, we need to talk about pharmacotherapy. And, and the next couple of slides will discuss the pharmacological and psychosocial treatment options for, continu for continuing alcohol use disorder care. So, you know, there is really not a huge volume of evidence um, when we're talking about using pharmacotherapy in the pregnant population. So the decision to offer AUD pharmacotherapy during pregnancy really needs to be made on a case-by-case -case basis in collaboration with the patient. Um, and so we need to talk about the risks and the benefits, right? And the risks not only of the medication, but the risk of not taking the medication and the risks associated with alcohol use in pregnancy. And so it's really important to know that in the case of moderate to severe alcohol use disorder, the risk of relapse to alcohol use may surpass the risks of pharmacotherapy. And I think this is something we really need to, to remember and feel comfortable in because you know, there can be a lot of fear around using medications in pregnancy, but when we're talking about alcohol use in particular, we know the risks of alcohol in pregnancy and they're very well established. So we need to be comfortable when we're talking about pharmacotherapy in this population. So we can consider offering naltrexone, acamprosate or gabapentin to prevent relapse in pregnant patients with moderate to severe alcohol use disorder. So this is a great table. So this um, outlines the safety of um, what we know about naltrexone, acamprosate, and gabapentin during pregnancy and the postpartum period. Um, so all three of these medications are FDA category C, and there are no adequate human studies on their safety during pregnancy. Although based on animal studies, there are possible risks associated with these medications. Their potential benefits may, in many situations, outweigh the risks based on that individualized assessment. Um, and we should also note that these medications are supported by robust evidence for non-pregnant uh, non people. So we use these medications in the non-pregnant population and there's really good evidence that they are effective at preventing relapse to alcohol use. So when you're thinking of prescribing these medications, you should refer to the contraindications and cautions for prescribing these medications. And these will be presented in the AUD guidelines. So for example, concurrent alcohol use while taking high doses of gabapentin does carry an increased risk of respiratory depression. So just take this into consideration when you're prescribing for your individual patients. Now, in terms of nursing or breastfeeding lactation, um, there's very little evidence available. So the decision to nurse while on these medications should be made on a case-by-case -case basis again. So available case reports suggest that these medications are likely safe for breastfeeding although gabapentin may um, carry a risk of drowsiness and decreased feeding. So that would require increased monitoring if you were to, worry, if you were to use that one in live patients. Now we know that pharmacotherapy is inadequate by itself. And so we also need to um, consider psychosocial treatment. So we know all, pregnant, um, all patients with AUD should be offered or referred to psychosocial treatments and support. Um, so evidence-based psychosocial and behavioral interventions for AUD can include motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, and contingency management. Another important consideration is to consider bed-based um, treatment facilities. So residential treatment settings may be suitable for some pregnant patients. So those with severe alcohol use disorder um, that have been requiring inpatient stabilization. Um, if they're unable to achieve stabilization in their you know, community setting, individuals with complex medical or um, mental health comorbidities, complex medical or psychosocial needs, uh, unstable housing or social circumstances. And you know, when you're considering selecting a facility, you need to um, consider the ability to provide appropriate addiction treatment with integrated medical and social, psychosocial support for that pregnant individual, um, making sure they have access to comprehensive prenatal um, postpartum or neonatal care, to when, but depending on where they are in their pregnancy journey. Um, and, you know, make sure that there is um, on-site accommodation or visitation for their family and their support network, because that's really huge, especially when we're looking at pregnant individuals. Now, we talked about this briefly earlier, but harm reduction is a principle of care, and we need to remember that clinicians providing care for pregnant or postpartum individuals who continue drinking alcohol we do need to adopt that harm reduction strategy. So um, what we can do is we can just promote safer alcohol use. So provide education and support around, you know, reducing the amount that they're drinking, making sure we're discontinuing any non-beverage alcohol use, 
refraining from drinking and driving. And so those are just a few simple harm reduction strategies that really can help just even simply engage the patient in care and can reduce their risk. Um, we also need to provide referral to resources that address social determinants of health, um, including housing, nutrition, childcare, legal services, financial assistance, et cetera. In terms of postpartum considerations, um, you know, postpartum patients should be supported to engage in healthy parent and infant bonding activity. So we should encourage rooming in lots of skin to skin, nursing, you know, the same usual inpatient supportive care or community care that, that all pregnant populations get. Um, and it's just important to remember that counseling people who are breastfeeding or lactating, they should be advised that alcohol is transferred into the breast milk. And generally speaking, we would recommend that bre breastfeeding patients be advised to reduce alcohol use um, and to either schedule nursing or storage of breast milk at least 2.5 hours, so two and a half hours after alcohol consumption. And you know, for patients who are on alcohol withdrawal or anti-craving medications, um, the risks and benefits in terms of those medications in the context of breastfeeding need to be discussed on a case-by-case -case basis. So in summary, um, lots of information, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. Um, alcohol use and untreated alcohol use disease, we know are associated with negative pregnancy outcomes, including fetal alcohol spectrum disease. And pregnant individuals with high-risk drinking can be supported by adopting recommended principles of care intended to assure equitable access to treatment. Uh, pregnant patients should receive harm reduction education and support. That's a really important piece that I think we need to remember leaving here today. Alcohol use screening and assessment should be conducted routinely through pregnancy and postpartum for all individuals. All pregnant patients should be offered adequate pharmacotherapy for withdrawal management, taking into consideration that case-by-case -case basis. And all pregnant and postpartum patients with alcohol use disease should be offered or referred to psychosocial treatment interventions. We should consider offering pharmacotherapy, the ones that we would recommend are naltrexone, acamprosate, or gabapentin to to prevent relapse to alcohol use in pregnant patients with moderate or severe alcohol use disease. And then we need to remember that ongoing postpartum and neonatal care and supports should be considered as a part of comprehensive care for patients with alcohol use disease. And lastly, this is just um, to touch on, I believe it's only accessible for individuals in British Columbia, but if you're providing addiction and substance use care and you do need additional specialist support, the BCCSU now offers an addiction medicine clinician support line and it's available all the time, 24 seven, 365. So it connects you with an expert in addiction medicine who can help with challenging situations in your practice. So please feel free to access it using the phone number on this website and more information about it is available on the BCCSU website. And this last slide just covers our references.